Hi guys, so O-Levels are coming soon and I'm sure that some of you are quite scared plus you want some tips. So I have Dylan Lim here from Paradigm Mathematics. Hi everyone, my name is Dylan. I'm the founder and principal of Math Paradigm. I've been teaching for the last eight years already, right? And it's only up to uh, upon graduation where I started Math Paradigm. So I've been running for around more than four years since 2020. I'll be teaching secondary school all the way to JC. All right, so I'm going to ask him some questions and basically I'm here to pick your brain to extract as much mm. uh, tips that O-level students can do. And we are targeting SEC 4 O-level students. So if you are SEC 3, you can still benefit a lot from this. And even if you're not taking O-levels, I'm sure there are a lot of tips will apply, mm. right? Okay, so the, a lot of these right, are common questions that my students ask me. So I'm just going to raise them. Okay, so one of them is, at this stage, we are so close to O-levels already. Mm. Should students still do topical TYS? Mm. Mm. Okay, first and foremost, before we before I answer the question, I think every student is at different stage of their revision. So there shouldn't be a blanket advice as to, oh, you should be doing this or this or this. But it really, we need to examine uh, where is, what's your current phase? Where are you at? So there are students that are s still completing their yearly TYS. There are students that have completed their yearly TYS. There are students that are still struggling in like, three to five topics there are students that are still lost and like <laughs> not knowing what's going on right so um back to the question uh, should you be focusing on topical TYS I would say if you know that there are certain topics that you are still fundamentally weak in then you should spend a couple of days right focusing on those weak topics and not neglect or uh, delay anymore right because all levels I mean for EMath is coming in around 20 days so you can't be delaying and procrastinating and you know not wanting to touch those topics that you have been avoiding since months ago yeah mm. all right yeah so if you're good then you there's no point uh, going to the topical tys you would recommend them to just do papers but if they are struggling at certain topics mm. and they know they've been putting it off they're quite lost in it then mm. they definitely should do that Mm, yeah, but uh, I think topical TI shouldn't be the only source of uh, topical revision. Uh, the reason being is because uh, it doesn't give you a full overview as to what you need to know in the topics, right? Because yes, you have 10 set of papers, but uh, if you examine the topical, the questions from the topical TIs, you realize that yes, it comes out here and there, but it's not very comprehensive. Yeah, so I would say that it is, it is a good um checkpoint right to check uh you know if let's say you were to go for your own levels right are you ready for to tackle this standard of questions but it should not be the only thing that you're relying on when you are doing a full topical revision what else would i use uh mm, okay so this is for our students but we can adapt it uh if if let's say you don't have the resources. So over here in our classes, uh, number one, we have a summary booklet. A summary booklet is basically all the types of questions that can come out in a specific topic, right? And uh, over here, our students have the privilege that it's really prepared for them, right? But if let's say you are, you don't have access to see these resources, then what you should be doing is, um, what you should be doing is basically, you need to ask yourself, right? After doing so many prelim papers, textbook assessment books right you know that in every chapter there's a specific set of questions that can be tested especially in the area of math right so what you should be doing is to look through everything that you have done in a specific topic right whether it's from assessment books top uh, textbooks whether it's from prelim papers whether it's from topical tys have all the resources ready in front of you and then uh, make sure that um i think the goal and and the question you ask yourself is, if I were to give you any question from that topic, are you able to solve it? If you have 80-90% confidence and say that, yes, this, this is easy to me already, right? Then then you know that, okay, you are more or less ready. But if the answer is no, I don't even know what can come out in this topic, uh, then that would be an indication that uh, you need more help and attention. Yeah, so that would be the summary booklet. And then something that uh, later we can talk about more is basically to... Uh, compile right questions from across all the prelim papers in a specific topic so that you can start you know identifying you know what's the range of questions that can be tested mm. yeah okay so wait going back to the um topical tys mm. is not enough because it doesn't cover all possible question types yes. of that topic correct so students should come up with their own 
common question list mm. for each topic. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I totally agree with that. And that is what our tuition that by tutor. We also have the commonly asked questions. Mm. Again, our students have the privilege of all topics mm. have been done for you and the model answers. And okay, side note, last time it used to be free. Last time I used to put all on the internet. But then my students were like, Hey, not fair. Then. And then I asked them, okay, would you like me to only give a bit, like, you know, topic one to six free, then the rest mm. is yours. Then they're like, yes, yes, yes. So I was like, okay, I shall do it. Mm. And yeah, I I also would say that if you don't have access to these resources, then um, you can compile it yourself. Mm. Yeah, it will take time. And uh, actually, I've has, had a student who asked me for chemistry and I was like, I, I cannot help. I'm not chem tutor. But then I said, I'm guessing, well, based on what I remember, Cam also has those commonly asked questions. Mm. And then I told him, why don't you compile a doc? Mm. Yeah, and then he did that. And I think he got A1 for the mm. the next exam. Mm. So it works. It works for many subjects. Yep. Yeah. Then just now you said the compile prelim yes. questions, right? Okay, why don't you tell me more about that? Mm, so this is something that I've done f- myself as a student, right? Especially... So I, I would like to categorize the whole syllabus into uh, different types of questions. So number one is uh, repetitive questions, right? Topics that are that you know that more or less the style of question are mostly the same. Those are questions that I would uh, train speed in because I, I know that hey, these are the you know, similar type of question. Then I would rather focus on how do I complete it uh, as fast or as quickly as possible. Then there's another category of questions, right? It's called the exposure question. You realize that, hey, Everything, every time it come out, it's different. Perhaps it's like maybe some kind of like diagram slash visualization question, geometry question. It's always different. Those are questions that you want a lot of exposure, right? So um, when I'm picking questions uh, to choose from prelim papers, first I have to know my intention. If it's a speed kind of question, then after that, I'll just train myself in, in speed. If it's an exposure question, then I'll compile all the geometry questions and then... Um, Right, uh, gain exposure and be aware that, oh, oh, question can be tested in this manner. Oh, question can be tested in this manner. Right, so naturally, whatever types of question that comes out, you are, you more or less, you have seen it, you have, you have seen it before. Mm, okay, and actually, this makes me think of the hunting exercise. Mm. So, okay, wait, you, you mentioned the speed training. Yeah. And then also, there's another type where you just want exposure. Correct. Okay, so for the speed training, right, maybe just tell us why is that uh, important for students to do? There are so many reasons, and I hope that through watching this, you are convinced why speed training is important. So, um, when I was a student, right, I was a really hardworking uh, student. But every time when it comes to exam, I realized that uh, I, I'm very poor in time management, right? I suffered like anxiety, I'm nervous and all. So then after I, I realized that um, it is because on my day to day practices, when I do my homework, uh, I'm I'm too chill. <laughs> I'm very relaxed, right? Maybe a question I take like 15, 20 minutes and then I'm distracted using my phone. Uh, up till perhaps in upper side and in JC, I start to realize that, hey, things got to change. And so when I'm doing any practice question at home, I begin to time myself. Hmm. So uh, let's dive into the several reasons. Number one, when you time yourself, uh, you know where your current standard Ah, so if let's say it's a three marks question, you know that yeah you're spending like fifteen minutes on this. <laughs> you know, yeah, definitely not ready and you do not know, right, maybe the framework or the steps to solve the question. Mm. Right. So you, you need to time yourself so that you know, hey, uh if this is currently being tested in exam, am I able to complete it uh, in time? Number two, uh as you know, as as you do more and more question, you you start to see your time uh to complete the question gets shorter and shorter mm. and shorter. So that is a good testament to your capabilities, but at the same time, it also gives you a lot of intrinsic motivation, right? So that's how I fall in love with like just just practicing because mm. um, let's say the first question, maybe I'm still not good, I take 10 minutes. But next question, I realize, eh, now I'm only taking around eight minutes, then seven, then six. So I, I'm seeing that myself improving. The time taken is get shorter and shorter and shorter. So I feel more motivated as yeah. well. And at the same time, as you're racing against the time, you're kind of creating a artificial environment right where you feel stress right because mm. the, the timer is like it's like tiktok tiktok is, is coming <laughs> right uh, you're racing against the time so naturally in the exam uh, you feel that the pressure and adrenaline you're kind of yeah. used to it because uh, that is what you encounter at home when in your day-to-day practice but if you don't right you just walk into exam hall suddenly there's a spike in adrenaline then that's where you start to feel nervous and anxious mm. yeah so these are there are many many reasons but having us having going through speed training 
having a sp- timer in front of you uh, is really essential to your practice. Mm, actually, when you were describing the when you go to exam hall, then the adrenaline hits, right? I was yeah. getting some flashbacks. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I agree with you. And in fact, I think this can be applied to bio, can be applied to all other subjects. Mm. Where Okay, so for bio, um, how I would advise students is that you see the marks, right? If it's three marks, three minutes. Mm. If it's five marks, five minutes. Mm. Yeah, very simple method. Actually, if you divide for the paper to um, the number of marks based on how much time you're given, it, you have more than one minute. I think you have like 1.3. One point one three. Uh, oh, for, for math, it's one and a half. Okay, for math, it's one yeah. and a half. Yeah. So you can use that for math, one and a half thing. Mm. Or I think you advise them go even faster, right? With uh, one, so um, the the exam, if let's say it's 40 marks, is 60 minutes. So mm. it's always one mark corresponds to one and a half minutes. But if we just spend just nice one and a half minutes, then you won't have time to check or to look through your paper once again. So the rule of thumb... Uh, mm. it's always one mark per minute mm. so that uh, if let's say it's a 60, 40 mark 60 minutes you complete in 40 minutes you still have 20 minutes to look through your work and that's more than sufficient mm. time so that is the benchmark and everyone should strive for mm. once you go to a next stage where you are the high A1 student uh, and something that I like to strive for is I like to complete the paper within half the time given <laughs> so if let's say it's a 2 hours paper I want to complete in an hour Mm. So that's how I push myself as a student uh, in, in O-levels and in A-levels. Mm. Well, what about those students who like, okay, because I've been through this myself, mindset mm. myself, where I just try to be very careful mm. with everything I'm writing mm. and make sure that I'm not making a mistake. Mm. And then at the end of the question, I also do a little bit of double checking. Mm. You know, I put into a calculator yeah. to check. And then I'm just slow, 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 mm. so slow, slow, steady. Yeah. Uh. <clears throat> and then I finish the paper like mm. right on time. Is I that see. better? Uh, I don't think that's a better. It's more of self-awareness, knowing what style you are. So that's kind of like a sprinter versus a marathoner. Mm. Right? So I'm the sprinter. <laughs> when I open my paper, I just like to complete uh, as soon as possible. But I do have friends. Uh, they like to do things slowly. And, you know, as they do one question, they make sure that it's great so that they don't have to come back mm. again. So it's really up to your preference. There's no hard and fast rule. But I've, you know, from teaching so many years, I feel that 70-80% of the people, they are usually the sprinters. Mm. They just want to complete as soon as possible. And then uh, they will spend the remaining time to check their work mm. upon completing the work. Mm. Yeah, I, I also agree with that. Mm. Okay, if you were to ask me which is which, although I agree, um, there are people who fit, who are more uniquely suited for certain ones. But if I had to choose one, right, I would choose the faster one, like the sprinter type. Because when you're in the weeds, when you're in the middle of the question, you can try to be careful. Like, And as for bio, right, it's kind of English. You need to write and phrase your sentences and put in the right keywords. And then you might not notice um, you're missing stuff until you take a, a step back, a bird's eye view, which you only get when you're checking because then you are already out of the weeds. Mm. So when I think it's more time efficient, actually, to... Maybe forego perfection, not to be like have everything mm. right there. But then when you're checking, you go through and then you will easily find those mistakes. Mm. I, I think to add on is also day-to-day practice, we don't spend the full allocated time, mm. right? So uh, if your day-to-day practice, you know, usually you don't you don't take the full two hours to complete the paper, then uh, in terms of how your, your mind is tuned to the style of uh, answering the questions, uh, I think... Uh, more students would would feel that uh, sprinting and completing papers ASAP that would be more uh, applicable and suitable. Oh, because they are already kind of doing that when they practice. When they are, they are doing the day-to-day practices. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Mm. Makes sense. Okay, there's another question. Oh, yeah. So this was related to the prelim. You said the exposure questions, mm. right? I think it's very applicable to bio also and probably other subjects. Mm. So I mentioned, I, I've heard that you mentioned the hunting exercise before. Yeah. So what is this and then how can students conduct it? Okay, so um, especially this phase, we are only about 20 days to O-levels, right? I think many students uh, would have insufficient to do more prelim papers even though they want to. And uh, it's just not practical to be sitting down and doing like 10 prelim papers across all your different subjects. So hunting exercise is to search for 
um, so there are three three types of questions that we are looking for. Okay, when we are doing the hunting process, number one, we are looking for challenging questions across you know topics that you might feel that you are a little bit weak in, right? Because if you look at like the twenty chapters that you are tested in, maybe ten of them is easy so you don't have to waste time right working through the easy questions anymore you just focus your attention on the harder ones right so i call it the challenging question next is the exposure questions right whereby you know that this 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 few chapters that are always changing there's so many variety the question you can't predict the the style the question type right so you want to pay more attention to it and lastly uh i would say some of the explanation questions that especially comes out in mathematics is you know as, as students in, in math, we like to calculate, but we don't like to explain things and we do not know what keywords uh, we should be looking for or write or something. So by searching for explanation questions, now you have a list of like 50 types of explanation questions and you have the keywords and the solutions to it and whatever that comes out, you, you know you are ready for it. So in essence, hunting is basically we are searching for a specific set of questions, right? Because we have no time to be sitting two hours to do a full paper. Perhaps in a brilliant paper, there's only three great questions that you want to work on. Then you move on to the next paper. So in a in a setting, now you can be doing 10 prelim papers in maybe like three hours, right? And there are only 30 questions to look out for in these 10 prelim papers. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I think a lot of students of, of ours, right, because we have this student resource folder on our Google Drive, we have hundreds of prelim papers. <laughs> that I've bought for them. And so they would probably be thinking, what in the world? I have no time to go through all of this, right? So that's very applicable. In fact, I told them that recently also to my students, go through the prelim papers and you will know one when you look at this question, uh, easy, this is a CAQ, which commonly asked question, yeah. rehearsable, you know? Uh, I can practice that myself. Then you find, oh, what is this weird question? Uh, leaf hopper um, sucking on the xylem and then how does that cause the plant to wilt uh, so if you're watching this and you don't know how then that's an example yeah we went through that recently in class mm. so yeah I, I would hunt I will get them to hunt for these also flip through then ask yourself can I do this question or would I struggle yeah. if I would struggle then let's do it like mm. actually write it up yeah. Yeah. and I didn't know that math got explanation question so you got to cut this like bio already yeah <laughs> Keywords that's, that's, that's a couple la. that's a couple <laughs> Yeah. I see, I see. So maybe you improve your bio math also improve <laughs> the explanation questions. I've heard you teach about the three C's technique. <coughs> so mm. tell us tell us how that works. Okay, so uh when you are doing a topical revision, a lot of students like we do not know what to revise. So you just flash back back in your sec one. A lot of times when you go for the exam when we are testing on a specific topic, we'll just be doing some random homework question, flipping through the notes. Right, and end up we go into the exam. Number one, the first challenge is like you do not know what's going to be tested. Right, you are unsure what are concepts, what are the steps, what's the framework, what's the formulas even that's coming up in your exams. Right, number two, you could be making a lot of careless mistakes. Right, uh, in these specific topics, over and over again. And last but not the least, uh, you may encounter very challenging questions uh, in the exam that you are unaware how to do. So the three C technique guides you how to study and how to prepare for your exams uh, for any particular topic, right? And the 3C stands for concept, careless mistakes, and challenging question. So let's say we are going for the exam, right? Let's say I'm tested on, example, algebra, simple one. So first thing you want to ask yourself is, in this chapter of algebra, what are all the types of questions that can be tested? That could be three to five. What are all the frameworks, the formulas, right? And how do I tackle such questions? So these are all the concepts that you need to know in this specific chapter. After you compile them, right, next we move on to the next C, which is what are all the careless mistakes that you have made before or potentially you could make in the exam and you compile them. We want to compile them uh, is because we want these mistakes to stay fresh in, in our head. Right? As students in the past, I made a lot of careless mistakes because I think that I remember the careless mistake, but it's not written down, it's not compiled. Right? Then, of course, uh, in the exam, I will fail to recognize it. I will fail to uh, you know, be more alert to avoid these uh, errors. Right, so uh, it's very important to compile all our mistakes so that before you walk into the exam hall, you'll just be looking at this like piece of paper. Oh, these are the five mistakes that I might potentially make in this chapter. I want to be careful of that. And when you tackle the question, it stays fresh. And last is challenging questions. In every topic, there's always some weird questions that you know you can't solve it, right? Or it's really, really challenging. So I would like to compile these questions out as well so that before the exam, I can just look through uh, one last time. And if it comes out, then fantastic. I have... I would know how to tackle the question. Yeah, so it's a very systematic approach to revise uh, for your exams for 
whatever topic that can be tested, right? Not just to learn, to revise, right? Um, as a last minute form of like um, revision, right? Before you walk into the exam hall. And even when you get back your paper, right? You can categorize your mistakes based on the three C's as well. So these three C's kind of universal uh, and can be used at every stage of your learning journey. Mm, so every exam that they go through, mm. they can actually start filtering it out into the three buckets, add to their notebook. Mm, they should. Yeah, when I was a student, I'm cr- I'm crazy to an extent whereby, let's say algebra, I know that, hey, these are the three challenging questions. First one come from maybe ABC secondary school. Second came from this TYS. Third one came from this assessment book. So I know exactly what are the variations of questions that can be tested. Right, and what are the challenging questions? And I know exactly, oh, these are the six big callous mistakes I, I need to avoid. So when I'm checking my work, which we'll talk about later, I, I'm not just blindly or randomly just checking line by line, but it's very specific to the question. When I'm tackling this question, I'm searching for these potential six mistakes that I could make. And that's how, uh, you know, over time, you'll just get better and better. Mm, okay, so if I were to guess, I know math is a long time already for me. Let's say X plus Y whole thing squared then yeah. you expand it out and you forgot the two x y in the middle so mm, that something would be like that. that is mistake. one potential careless mistake that students might make mm-hmm. yeah so when you are doing your expansion you are not just checking like oh did i expand correctly right because that's level one did i expand correctly but level two is did i make this specific mistake did i make this error you are looking out at like all the mistakes that students might make and then you are just searching for it mm. yeah yeah, and actually that's that's more efficient, that's more smart. Mm. Uh, if students have heard of the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, mm. right? So you applying that, uh, 20% of all the possible mistakes you have made would account for 80% of your careless mistakes. Mm. So what you're doing with that list, right, is actually you're listing out the 20%. Yeah. And then if you just search for those, you will catch 80% of your mistakes already. Mm, you should. Yeah, so yeah. that's good. And I actually, one of, I, I, I tell my students that uh, careless mistakes, right, are not unavoidable. Mm. Like, what you're doing is strategically uh, looking for the patterns. Like, I always mm. make this mistake, mm. so uh, I'm not going to make that. Mm. And one of them for me w- was actually in math, because I will write my zero, right? Then at the top, there's a little thing that I never close the circle. Yeah. So it looks like a six. Then uh, after when I transfer, it became a six. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> from then on, I decided th- this is like a systematic error, right? Yeah. So I decided I will always write my zero perfectly from now on so mm, that, that it won't be a possibility. Yeah. Eliminate. So, since we're on the topic of careless mistake, right? Mm. Mm, for anyone that's listening, we just must understand that we are humans. Humans make careless mistakes, right? Uh, you know, eventually as you, you graduate, you become a doctor, a lawyer, all of us would make mistakes at some point. But how do we uh, avoid mistakes? So in class, I would always you know when i'm teaching on the topic of careless mistake i always like to play this video of uh, a group of surgeons before they start you know their operation they have a checklist mm. so step one right am i operating on the correct patient our patient <laughs> is like uh, alex all right <laughs> alex is 59 years old alex has these uh, allergies alex we are operating on the left leg not the right leg he's <laughs> in the left leg so you can see that we are all humans we make mistakes right and Obviously, if you look at news and, and you scroll through all the past history, there are people that operate on the wrong patient, operate on the wrong leg, given the wrong medications. And so a checklist is created. So how can we learn from this is that when we go for the exam, right, as we are checking through the paper, there must be a checklist as well. Because if you don't, you are just looking through randomly. Right, you're not sure what to look out for. But if you have a checklist, okay, step one, I'm searching for this. Okay, tick, perfect. There's no error there. Step two, let's check for this error. All good. Step three, step four, step five. So same thing as a doctor, as a pilot or whatever, there, there's always a specific like 10 steps process that uh, you, you should create and follow so that uh, you are minimizing uh, those errors in the exam. Hmm. Okay, so I'm asking on behalf of some students listening to this. They might mm. be like, okay, but I have each topic, right? Different possible case mistakes. So mm. it, why if in total I have like 100? Then how do I remember these 100 when I walk into the exam? That's why it comes from a lot of repetition outside of class, such that it becomes a muscle memory, right? You just know that like in this chapter, these are the two, three things that I look out for. In this chapter, these are the two, three things that I look out for. Yeah, so... Uh, obviously, if you were to write out everything, it feels overwhelming. But uh, after a while, and somehow you have been, we have been learning and studying for the last two years already, right? So uh, this should be a compiled yeah, uh, 
accumulation like, of all the efforts they have put in over the last two years. Mm. Yeah. So to refresh your memory before you go to the exam, mm. you would read through it, right? Mm. Right before you walk in the exam hall. Yeah. So I actually have the same thing for our students at that bio tutor. We have compiled a common misconceptions slash careless mistakes mm. checklist. So I will tell our students, yeah, so if you're a student listening to this, before the exam, please look at that page, okay? And recently, we have mailed out the printed notes to y'all, and it has that at near the end, uh, common misconceptions. So I would definitely read through that before walking in. Mm. Can save you for a few marks, for sure. Yeah. So talk about 3Cs already. Okay, redo TYS yearly. Yeah. So a lot of students ask me, uh, should they redo the TYS yearly? Because maybe their school has forced them to already do some, mm. and then the rest of the time, they finish already, 10 years. So now, should they redo? Yeah, so what's your take on that? Okay. Um, before we think about redoing the TYS, the question that you must ask yourself is, if I were to give you any questions from the yearly TYS, are you confident in solving it? Because um, what I firmly believe is all these questions, right, set of questions have been tested before. It doesn't make sense if they were to test it again. Yeah, say, eh, hey, I can't solve it. Mm. Right, so if uh, the answer is, nah, I think... If these three questions that comes up, you know, again, I'm unable to solve it, it means that you are still not ready and there are still a lot of misconception. Then for this group of people, then I encourage you to relook at the TYS. And of course, when you are doing the first time, right, you need to look at what is your current score. If the first time you are scoring 50 upon 100, then I believe you ought to redo your TYS because it just shows that, you know, half of the questions you are unable to do it. Why not do it again and see, are you at a 70% now? Are you at an 80% now? Versus on the other hand, there are students that are scoring 90% for the TYS. Should we do it? And I say, maybe you don't have to redo the full paper. You just need to redo on some of the selected questions. So back to the, uh, you know, at the start where we talk about, you need to know where's your current state sheet. And the ultimate yard state is, whatever question I posted from the TYS, you should be able to solve them. Yeah, if you're confident, then then you don't have to redo it anymore. I see. Yeah. So you need, to know, like I noticed a common theme, you need mm. to assess where you are at. Mm. And so, if you are very jialat, then you should redo the TY. <laughs> you should. Yeah. <laughs> then, if you are kind of confident, but some of the question types you are not confident, mm. then just redo those. Those specific questions. Mm. If not, you're going to waste like one hour, right, redoing questions that you have already, you already know exactly. how to do it. So then, that wouldn't be efficient. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of this, right, comes down to intuitively asking yourself, What's the, you know, effort to reward ratio, effort to benefit ratio? So if I have to spend one hour redoing these so-called easy questions, is it really benefiting me? Some students might might like th- doing it because it feels like it boosts your ego. You know, like, oh, look, all this easy, I'm so good. But actually, is it benefiting you? It's not re- benefiting you. Yeah. So uh, look out, just keep that in mind. Ask yourself, is this worth my time? Because your time is so short now already. Is this worth my time? Uh, if I redo these hard questions, it may take me 30 minutes only from this paper and it can give me so much benefit. Mm. So it'll be worth. Yeah. And if doing the rest of the questions, right, you might say that, hey, I still benefit, but the benefit is quite low, mm. then you need a sacrifice mm. because we have limited time now. Yeah. yeah. So redoing, and okay, I also heard something from someone before about redoing the TYS yearly, which is, okay, this is for bio, yeah? And for some, most schools, they will have gotten you to do the TYS topical as homework even. So you probably finished that already. Then you do TYS yearly, let's say you finish that also. So if you think about it, a lot of questions from TYS yearly you have done already in the topical. It's repeating. So you already have that double practice. So if you redo it, um, when you're already quite good at it, then I would say don't, don't waste your time. Go to other new questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is for students who didn't study enough before the prelims. Mm. And after the prelims, they got a nasty shock. Yeah. They were like, I, I'm failing or I'm almost failing mm. for some of their subjects or even most of, the, of their subjects. Mm. But now they're very serious. Okay, they've gotten the wake-up call and they are going to study hard. So how can they salvage this? How can they fix this? Maybe you can talk in general for all, top, uh, all subjects or you can also talk just specifically how can they salvage math mm. if that's their situation for math. Mm. Mm. Before we talk about the how, uh, you know, you as a student, right? The first thing is you got to lay out, okay, so I have 20 days left. What can I, what should I complete 
such that I'll feel prepared for my O-levels. So we need to have a reality, reality check. What should I complete? And it's not just for those that are struggling, but even those that are getting Cs, Bs, or As, right? We can do that. Uh, everyone can do that. So ask yourself, um, before I walk to the exam hall, what do I want to complete? Or what should be completed so that I feel that eh, I'm ready for O-levels? List them down. For math, for sciences, for humanities, for your language. Right. Uh, why I talk about this is because a lot of times, no one teaches us how to manage and plan our timetable. So it feels like, hey, today I wake up. Okay, today is a math day. Tomorrow is a science day. And then when you just say today is a math day, how many questions are you going to do? Or oh, maybe I do three questions and I use my phone and then I'm not on the bed. <laughs> so you're not clear as to what should be completed. So um, we are always planning. They're always planning. I say planning forward. But instead, you should plan backwards. Means, okay, before I walk to the exam hall, I want to finish my yearly TYS. I want to complete my full topical revision. I want to complete the hunting exercise. Right, so these are the three things I want to do. So I can, then I can speed up. Okay, if I want to complete all this by 20th October, right, then I should complete my yearly TYS by maybe like 10th of October, example. Then, oh, okay, I have around eight days left. How many papers should I be doing? So it's like you're breaking down, you know, this entire chunk into small little parts and you know that if, if I want to be on track I need to complete my yearly device by hook or by crook this week then now there's a goal if not it's just very fluff low I just want to do one paper per day or there's no reasons behind it so if you plan according that way you do not know whether you're doing too much too little whether you're on track but if you plan backwards now you realize that okay as long as I complete you know, my TYS by this certain date and I move on to this next revision by this certain date you know that before the exam I'm ready yeah so Back to your questions, for students that are uh, not doing well and you didn't do well for prelims, same thing, you got 20 days left. Um, what do you want to complete so that you feel ready? Minimally, you should be, you know, complete your topical revision yearly TYS. You, maybe you will have insufficient time to do hunting or to do prelim papers, but that's, you know, that's, that's fine, you have no time. Minimally, if you complete your yearly TYS or topical TYS, right, you should at least to get a B la, mm. right uh, if everything goes well so work work backwards mm. uh, from, from there yeah so set the deadline mm. work backwards and then you create mini deadlines yeah. for yourself mm. yeah agree with that and I okay so what I'd add on to that right is like just now you mentioned they might not have time for prelims hunting exercise right mm. so you are actually telling them to sacrifice some things because of the limited time mm. So we have to just do the most crucial things that give you the most benefit. Again, it's the, the effort to benefit. The 80 ratio. 20, right? Yeah. Mm. Yes, true. Correct. So go for the 20% that gives the 80% result. Right. Yeah. I I would say, okay, this is my guess for the other subjects also. Um, probably applies to sciences and math. Uh, language probably not. Which is, again, compiling the commonly asked questions. So for, for your tuition, it's the summary booklets, right? Mm. Yeah. So I would... Uh, if, if I was a student and I was like dying in my prelims, the first thing I would do is that I would make sure that I know what are all the question types from each topic and how to answer them. Mm. That will be the... In fact, for open-ended questions in bio, which is what students always struggle with, mm. then I always tell them, this is the one most important thing that will help your open-ended questions. Mm. Yeah. So for math, is there any other examples of if you have this crucial thing, right? Most of the that that's the most mm. you know, ratio for the benefit to effort. I think it's um one way to look at it is um the whole math syllabus can be broken down into four teams. Right. I believe that in biology that you have teams mm. as well. Yeah, so um you can strategically map out your revision based on the teams and based on uh you know what are your stronger teams and your weaker teams mm. so the the most common one like in math there's an algebra team and that would be the first thing that you need to make sure that you get that 25 percent in because that's something that you have been learning since sec one right then after that we have you know geometry team and some of the sec four topics so you can uh, arrange your revision uh based on like 25 percent 25 percent 25 percent 25 percent yeah and that could help you to maybe like simplify things a little bit more because if you break into like 20 chapters it feels overwhelming yeah, but when you break into like, okay, these are the four pillars, right, of this whole syllabus, then at least it helps you to uh, make, make, make you less stressed, I hope. Mm. Yeah. All right, right. Anything else to add for tips on uh, how they can salvage it, especially if they're 
you know, they're really serious now and they're in this like mad sprint mm. this last period. I think it's to create more time for yourself. Mm. Yeah. So as you look at your friends, you know, those that have worked ha- harder and earlier on, right, they are mm. reaping the benefits mm. because they have lesser to, you know, to cram. You know, but for you, if let's say you have start a little bit uh, later, then maybe you can wake up a little bit earlier. Mm-hmm. You can sleep a bit later, right? And just go all out and make sure that, you know, whatever you set out to complete, uh, you complete in time mm-hmm. and not have any regrets at the end of the day. Yeah. So we're just creating more time. And mm. you, I bet most students listening to this, right, are not like sucking as much time out of their day as possible. I'm sure there are many inefficiencies and wasted times. Yeah, so whatever that is, like maybe looking at phone when, you know, you shouldn't. Or, yeah, just go and see your screen time. Uh. How much YouTube, how much Instagram, how much TikTok, mm, right? Yeah. Then if you ask, if you say, hey, I just, I wish I could do more, but I just don't have enough time. Then like, look at your screen time. That's your time. We found it. Yeah, so that's one example. Mm. And others could be um, studying with friends. Like, if that is something that actually makes you less productive, yeah, be aware to see that and then just decide not to. Uh, don't study friends. You can still, okay, so sidetrack a bit. You can still have the friends element, right? By having accountability with your friends, okay, which is you tell them, okay, I'm going to do this paper and this paper by today. Uh, and then they will tell you what they are going to do. Then at the end of the day, you check in on each other. So you can still have the friends social element, but max productivity. And if you want to up the stakes on that, right, which is something I do for myself, is I will tell my friend, if I don't finish this this, I have to pay you $5, I have to pay you $10, I have to buy you a coffee or a drink. And then they also have the same thing. Mm. So now there's stakes and it just becomes so much higher chance that you'll actually do it on time. Mm. Yeah. Mm, totally agree with you. Um, I feel that this whole process is a learning journey, right? When we are back in lower sec and all, we don't really know how to study. No one teaches us how to study. But along the way, right, you f- start to find out better studying methods, studying techniques, right? You start to know how to memorize better, who to study with, right, with music, without music, you know, all these things. You just get to know yourself better and the environment that puts you in uh and helps you to focus. Yeah. But I hope that uh this this period is really um, helps you to grow as a as a student as well. Because I always believe that uh, more exams are coming up in poly, in JC, in university. And the earlier you know yourself, the earlier you know how to study, then the earlier you crack the code of like taking exams. Yeah. But back to the point, uh, something that you mentioned, uh, I think I just want to uh, share that with the students, which is that because for the longest time since like one, right, a lot of times before your exams, you, are always, you always have school. But this period, you know, school has ended, you all have graduated, you are at home every day. So, it could be a little bit sh- a shock to some students like, hey, I wake up 10 a.m., what should I do today? I have the whole day in front of me. I have no idea like, how should I be studying math, science, humanities, English? How should I be planning my time? Right, so uh, it may come as a shock as to some students who have never been like planning their life <laughs> before. Yeah, so um, that becomes really, really important. If you have tips, you can um, talk about that as well. <clears throat> yeah, so totally agree. Uh, when... It's, it's quite scary mm. that your whole day is yours to to use. And if you waste it, it's completely on you. Because, yeah, and, and you also have no one to pressurize you yeah. or to, to, to mark your attendance when you're at school. So there's that lack of um, accountability and you have to take full responsibility. So one solution that I'm implementing for my students for, and, and uh, I actually did this last year also, and the students really liked it, so we're resuming it. It's called study blocks. Right, so it's, it's quite simple. I'll just host a Zoom and then our students can come in and then at the start, we'll all declare like, okay, what are we going to do this hour? Mm. And then at the end, we'll all report, okay, what did we do this hour? Mm. So just now the accountability with the friend that I mentioned, yeah, this is the same, except that it's a faster feedback cycle because it's only one hour, then you're going to report already. Yeah. Plus you'll see like the gallery of all the faces of other people in our class, right, studying. So then when you're tempted to use your phone, then you'll see all of them mugging, right? Then you'll be like, cannot, cannot. Then you'll feel the peer pressure, you know? Yeah, so we're going to implement that. And I'm this week, Monday, yeah, on Monday, probably we will, we will start ready for our students. So a huge thing to help pro- with procrastination. So if 
you're not in our class, you can still actually have that. If you want to study with your friends, you can do that. Just don't give in to the temptation to uh, chat with them or talk to them mm. during that one Actually hour. on YouTube, oh, I think there are some websites, study room or something, mm. whereby you can study across with students across the globe. Mm. And you, uh, you, know, you can just watch them studying and hopefully <laughs> you'll feel like pressured that <laughs> you should be focusing as well. Yeah. yeah. There, are, there are these kind of things. There are those kind of, and mm. I believe they're free also. Yeah, they are, they are. Mm-hmm. And even tracking like how many hours you study and all. The oh. YPT and all that. Oh, yeah. There, there's quite a lot of apps and all. So there's no excuse. Mm. <laughs> our, actually, our students recommended the YPT thing. Yeah. So I was like, okay, fine, fine, I'll create it. Then they're like, oh, yay. Then <laughs> yeah, they all joined that. So then you can like compete with other people. I like, like, see, I, I did more hours than, than mm. you. Yeah. Mm, any more ideas on how they can not procrastinate? Not procrastinate. Uh, mm, I got I got one. Yeah. Which is that um, give put your phone outside the room mm. when you are studying. Like really, just put it outside. Uh, you can even give to your parents, right? You can say that I'm studying now. I put here beside you. Later, I will come and take it. Like, okay, I bet most students would have faced this also when I was younger. Your parents don't trust you. Your parents are always think you're irresponsible. You're lazy. You're not studying. Why are you not studying enough? Why are you always playing your phone, right? So p- use this as an opportunity to fix that perception of you. Then you'll be like, wow, you know, my child's really getting responsible and mature. I can trust uh, them with more things and hopefully they will not be so controlling of you. Yeah, you got any more? Uh, I think it's back to environment, right? Um, back when I was in lower sec all the way to upper sec, I was always searching for the best environment to study. So I started off you know, in sec to in Burger Kings, in some random cafes, and realized that <coughs> it, is, it doesn't really help. Because <coughs> I'm spending like half the amount of time thinking of what to eat, ordering, and then having french fries in, in my hands. <laughs> yeah, then after that, I slowly transited to like the library. So library was a big part of my studying life uh, in upper sec, all the way to JC. Yeah, especially, I'm surrounded with a lot of different people uh, even people that I never met before, so I, you know, I I see people from JC, I see you from university studying. I'm like, hey, one day I'll be like them, and wow, they are they can concentrate for three hours. Maybe like, how did they do that? So I'm like sitting beside a NUS girl or NTU girl, right? Then they are like working really hard, so I get inspired to work hard as well. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, if home is not a conducive environment, then then you should consider like just leaving the home, and going to the library. Mm. Yeah. That yeah. should really help. Totally agree. For for myself, okay, so again, it comes down to awareness of your own uniqueness. Yeah. I notice that I get too distracted when I'm outside. Even if it's a quiet library, right? Mm. I'll, my mind will keep thinking of the people who are around me and like kind of like monitoring them or uh-huh. something. So I, I notice I'm most myself when I'm at home and I close the door. Mm. So you see, if your uh, house, people are talking loudly, you can also tell them, hey, I, I'm studying now, help me. And then I... You can also let them know, I'm studying now, I'm going to do a time practice right now for what is one hour. That's why I'm going to close the door. Yeah, and then let them know that. Uh, but if that's not possible, then I agree. You should go out to a quiet place. Yeah. And, okay, small tip about going out, right? Whenever I have to work outside, I always put um, my earphones in and then I will play the same song on repeat. Mm. And it's a song that has no words. Because when there are li- lyrics, when there are words, then your your mind will start mm. like, trying to understand them, right? Mm. And that uh, distracts you. Uh. So, okay, for me, I use a uh, Plants vs. Zombies soundtrack. Oh, you like that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And and it's the, it's the one um, where it basically it feels quite hype yeah. and, and hyper. Mm. So, it puts me in the mode of like, mm. okay, let's like be serious and yeah. fast and, mm. and do my work. Yeah. And it keeps repeating. So, now it becomes a trigger. So, when I am out, I, once I see, start hearing that song, I go into that mode mm. of like, okay, I'm very serious and I'm working fast mm. now. Yeah, so loop it mm-hmm. helps you not be distracted, mm. um, blocks out the noise, and it becomes a trigger for you also. Mm. So, so many benefits there. Yeah, music is, plays a big role. So another option, mm. which is if someone has done badly for prelims, right? Mm. What's your take on them dropping to combine for some subjects? Example, chem and bio, they were taking pure, and now they want to drop to mm. combine chem bio. Yeah, what's mm. your take on that? I think first. That is a strategic option, right? You need to ask yourself, like, number one is, do you need these subjects in JC or in Polytechnic? Because uh, some of the courses or some of the schools have prerequisite. Especially if you say that I want to go to JC Science Stream, then uh, 
you know, for you to take the science stream, certain schools have certain subject prerequisite that you need to have pure sciences, else you can't even take it. So you need to consider that factor. And number two is, uh, in terms of your R1R4 and R5 calculation, do you need this subject? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if the answer is no to the above, like it doesn't affect your, you know, school options or maybe even your career options in the future, then uh, if strategically it helps you to manage better, then by all means you can consider to drop drop it because at the end of the day uh, you're assessed based on your whole r4 or r5 so as long as it helps you to gain a higher chance and a better fighting chance right then that then you can consider that mm, all right and uh, recently a student uh, asked me about history mm. so he takes nine subjects mm. and he was he he said okay you know i'm going to give up on history i know that um, I'm really quite doing quite bad at it and it's not going to affect my L1, R4, L1, mm. R5 and I know I'm not going to like be a historian in future it's not going to affect my career yeah. and so he, he said you know uh, and actually this subject was taking out a lot of his time mm. like he showed me his schedule and he was like ah, I have no time to fit in more papers because you know I have to study history, history then I'm like okay how about you take it and you drag it all to the right before the history exam Mm. so history is after all quite a mem- memory based subject mm. and we know memory fades with time right yeah. so if you drag it up you cram firstly you'll free up all your weeks mm. to actually revise the important subjects secondly uh, it'll be most fresh in your mind mm. so again I'm going for that effort to benefit ratio yeah. the effort for that subject you put so little just one day right mm. the benefit is rather huge mm. and okay in the end he decided to drop the subject completely yeah. and I think it's a good choice so now yeah. that's completely off your plate and yeah, it's, it's a very strategic move. Like. Anyway, he has sub- nine subjects. He doesn't need that many. Yeah, he has nine, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, you need to, I mean, for those that, uh, you, you have to speak to a teacher and, p- and your parents first though. Mm. Don't, don't make reckless uh, mm. decisions. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but about combined bio, right? Mm. And pure bio. So I've heard students ask me this before. Like, oh, my teacher is saying after my prelim or after my WA, my teacher said, um, I should drop to combine. Then sometimes I'm like, no, you shouldn't drop the combine. You are good. Like you are have you have the ability. You definitely can do this. Mm. I, I've seen you in class. I've seen uh, how you answer questions also. So I believe that they can score a very decent grade for pure mm. if they continue working mm. at it. They can get for sure B three or even A two, which is dis- distinction already, right? Mm. So I would caution against dropping um so so easily. Because um, sometimes school teachers will like will just tell you, ah, you can't do it, just drop to combine. But I've noticed a few students already who their teachers told them that. And I said, no, you, you absolutely can do it for the um, for bio. I know that they can do it. So consider it before dropping. Because uh, when you do drop, yes, it is easier to get the higher grade. Yeah. It's going to be easier uh, paper. But you would kind of have wasted a lot of hard work studying for um, for the pure subjects. And I believe there are even, yeah, there are going to be topics taken out. Yeah. So you have studied those topics kind of for nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you're like really close already, then I would recommend not dropping it. Okay, uh, this question. This one, right, is I'm thinking from students point of view, they confirm want to ask us this question. Mm. So is it possible for someone who scored E8 or D7 for mm. prelims mm. to get A2 or A1 for O-levels? Mm, I've seen cases before, but if you talk about E8, F9 to A1, A2, that's more on the rarer side. B3, B4 is more common, yeah, especially with the last minute cramps. But if you want to secure the distinction, uh, there are students that... Okay, so we need to look at it from a different perspective. Number one is some schools prelim papers are really hard and it's just meant to kill. And at the end of the day, these are the group of students that eventually get distinctions. Yeah, so uh, you must have uh, have an awareness check as to is it is it really me <laughs> or the, the people is really set to to of a really, really tough standard. Okay, but if we put that aside, uh, it really depends what you do in the remaining 20 days because there are cases where students get distinctions at the end of the day. Yeah. But uh, of course, it comes with really a lot of hard work, effort, strategic planning, and it's never by luck or chance mm. from a fail to an A. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Agree. And and for our tuition also, we've had examples of E8 to A2, D7 to A2. Mm. Yeah, a few students last year, I think three or four. Mm. And so 
it is possible. Yeah, especially for bio, I would say it is possible. Mm. Um, <coughs> I'm pretty sure for math also is possible. It's just difficult. Mm. What I noticed about those students, right, who managed to go from EA to A to that kind, was that the moment they entered my tuition, I already can see that they're serious. Mm. Like, they weren't playing around. They were serious and they were asking for advice, like, what should I do? What should I work on? And then they yeah. actually work on it. Mm. And I'm sure your tuition has yeah. a lot of resources also for them, mm. right? So these students would use the resources. They wouldn't just like, yeah. uh, let's just go with the flow. I mean, they are coachable. They just listen to exactly what you, you share. They follow the plan. And their output is insanely crazy as well. Because there are students that say, hey, you know, if let's say you give a paper, right, they'll complain, ah, so many. Then every question, like some students will complain. But on the flip side, some of the super growth-driven students, they're like, give me more, give me more, right? They can do three papers in a day and they just complete so much more, right? So, um, find friends who, who exhibit such character and get inspired by them. Yeah, you really will see how much they can improve in a short amount of time. Yeah. I think uh, as I'm sharing this one more pointer is don't be afraid to ask because I always find that those who ask more they learn more and they grow the fastest as well so I always share this example with all my students saying that the ones who reach out most will eventually get, get the distinctions because they just move at such a rapid pace yeah and the easiest example is um, if let's say I face a difficulty and I wait one week later for tuition to ask I'm still stuck at that one question for the entire week. Versus a, a student that, you know, get the doubts cleared, can do three more questions, get another doubts cleared, do another three more questions. So it's like this student has really completed like me 10 questions in that week. So you are 10 times right ahead of the student that just delay. Mm. Yeah. All right. So ask fast. I think I saw one of your posts before of like, um, this student asked so many questions to you on WhatsApp and mm. then they end up getting the, you know, A1 or A2. So you've noticed mm. that correlation, right? More the than more. that, I, I, think, I, I, think, I think I created like a... Yeah. <laughs> I think I have some photos and like screenshots uh, whereby uh. the more you ask, it's like mm. you're not even getting an A, you're getting a top in the level. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, yeah you, should, you should totally ask. Especially, you you know, you seek help to find tutors, right? Then you should maximize um, you know, everything. Mm. Yeah. When So those students who I mentioned, they like D7 to A2, EA to A2, right? Those students, um, even C6 to A2 also, I noticed those are the ones who ask. Mm. And you, you can see that they're actually thinking. They are, they are really concerned about, is this correct? Is what I'm writing correct? They don't just let the mistake slide. Yeah. So if you let it slide, then you don't get the benefit from doing that practice paper. Yeah. So they, they ask a lot. Um, you can see that they're thinking when they ask also. Mm. And when I was a student, that's what I did also yeah. for, for my subjects. Mm. And... Okay, <laughs> I don't know whether I should say this. Um, oh, I know, I think he knows. So, my econ tuition, right, is actually called that econ tutor when I was uh, in JC. So, that's why I named my tuition that by a tutor. Then, there was a point in time where I've, I felt like, yeah, I'm quite good at this subject already, you know, with all the help. So, I was like, huh, do I need to stay here? Mm. But because I could ask him questions anytime and he would reply rather fast, like within a day, like, that was the main reason I was staying. It's just so I could ask. And yeah, it's, it's true. When I ask so many, then I can see that for, for various subjects, the more I ask, the higher my grades got. Mm. Good tactic. Yeah, and that's, that's why for our tuition, we have that any time of the week, you can ask questions on WhatsApp. And in fact, I'm trying to get my new tutors in training to also help me answer so that we can answer faster. Mm. Yeah, you, you also have that, right? Where they can ask you anytime. Yeah, it's very good. Okay, another, I don't know why is this uh, nosy question that students will ask. Do you think for this year, O-levels, it'll be easier or harder? Or you can just speak for math. Uh. Mm, I think just based on, okay, we should just assume that the papers are getting harder and harder every every year. Yeah, if you can compare to like uh, the paper 10 years ago versus today, you'll realize that the paper today is definitely harder because students are getting more and more prepared. So I think just prepare everything for the worst and, and see how tough it can get. But I think the mentality that all of us uh, should walk into the exam hall is not about whether the paper is easy or or hard. But uh, something that I shared and I learned uh, recently 
is to go in the mentality of like whatever the paper is bring it on I'm ready for for the challenge I think that would be a that would be the that would be the mindset I hope all my students will have when they walk into the exam hall not like ah yeah peace lah peace lah easy paper (laughs) oh uh, let me just get a pass yeah but it's like walk into it I'm ready I've done everything I can the preparation the hours the effort come let's do this and see you know what's the questions this year Mm. come at me yeah let's break yeah, it on so then that that would be quite a you know it's a, a very fresh perspective like, and when you go into the exam hall I, I feel that you'll do really well mm. that's nice mm. <clears throat> okay my guess for students who ask me about bio right my guess is that maybe this year might be harder mm. okay this is just a random guess okay it's, yeah. it's not going to confirm anything um, because last year's paper was actually easier than expected mm. and so the downside of an easy paper is that I had some students who, um, you know, you think that ah, this one confirmed they will get A1. But then they only got A2. That was mm. a bit sad for them because I want them to get A1. And it's likely due to everyone getting so good that the moderation brings people's uh, grades down. Mm. So you had to write really perfect answers mm. in the bio open-ended to mm. get good grades for that. <coughs> and Which is why I tell my students always to spam as many keywords as you can, mm. relevant keywords, make it as filled with keywords as possible so that even if the moderation brings everyone's grade down, you you still come on top. One of the last questions is, ah, yeah, this is another common one that students always ask. Mm. Is it too late to join tuition now when, you know, you may only stay in tuition for a month? Mm-hmm. Um, can it help? You know, is it any benefit? Uh, I think that depends on the type of programs that you join. There are some places that offers like last minute, uh, you know, f- f- crash course, last minute help or last minute resources. If the tuition uh, place uh, offers that kind of help and you feel that, that you know, it's like a just in time like support that you need, then definitely you can consider. Yeah, but you must do your own homework and, and see if, you know, whatever that they offer is what you, what you need at this current juncture. Mm, okay, I, I think I get I get this question from students who and then parents also who want to join our tuition at their bio tutor. And I'd say yes, there there is a lot of help that can be done and you can change a lot in one month. Um so for those tuitions I, I think that there's a, there's this mindset of like, okay, tuition is a long term thing where you have to slowly practice week after week, you know, you you get more enrichment every week. Right. And then this is how it would help you. So if you only join for that one month, it wouldn't benefit. But our, for us, we actually give students so much resources that they can actually self-study almost everything, even if they only have one month. It's just that you have to study a lot. So we have um, all the past lessons right of the year. We actually let the students watch it also. We don't charge them extra. So I know some tuition centers, they, they say like, oh, you want a recording? Okay, then you must charge extra. Then I don't think we'll ever do that at that bio tutor. And we have cut crash course clips from each lesson so like let's say this is explaining the cardiac cycle right i cut out just that part we put into this folder on google drive so whatever concept you need a refresher on you just go there and then you can watch it already then you can learn so we got the notes for that concept we got a teaching right the crash course clip and then we got the commonly asked questions also so as a student who joins even though it's last minute they can self-study a lot by themselves you can even watch a past lesson if you are so bad that you need from scratch teaching yeah. and yeah so, so if I would use an analogy it's kind of like if you are by yourself and you're trying to cram in this last month mm. you only have a few puzzle pieces mm. to make that big picture which is to secure that subject to be confident in it you only have a few pieces because you're lacking in content foundation mm. and then you also lack the skill so you don't know how to fit in those pieces so by yourself it's going to be quite a dire situation so even if you only have one month of help, but we give you all the pieces already, we like give you the box, okay, here it is. Now you can take out all the pieces you want. That's all the content teaching. Then you also get the skill of how should I put it? Plus you can quickly ask for the guidance. Yeah, even though it's only one month, you can ask questions of, you know, what's wrong with my answer here? Then there's like guidance. Oh, you should put the piece here. Yeah. And... Hmm. Okay, so uh, unfortunately for my classes, they are already full. But I have spots in my tutor's classes. Okay, so if you are interested to join, you can join my tutor's classes. And yeah, anything to add to that? 
Mm, I wish you all the very best for mm. your O-levels exams. And uh, if you're feeling stressed, overwhelmed or anything, right, I appreciate that you can just drop us a DM at the bio tutor or myself. And yeah, lah, um, don't be alone. Don't suffer alone or suffer in silence this period. Always find, you know, a support system, whether it's your parents, your friends, or, you know, whoever that you feel that can give you some listening ear or advice. I think that can help you to make the whole journey less lonely. And uh, it can help you to push you to the last, like, finishing lane as well. Mm. I th- I To end off, I will have two um, <clears throat> pieces of advice or two things to say about this period. Mm. So actually three. Number one is there is hope. Yeah. Okay, don't give up. There is hope. A lot can change in one month. A lot can change in 30 days. Mm. Okay. And oh yeah, just going back to the, like let's say you draw intuition. If you were, if you could push up your grades by two, isn't that already fantastic compared to no change? Yeah, so a lot can change. Um, there is hope. Okay, then number two is if I were to summarize all the study tips, right, and revision tips, it's all in that ratio again. It's effort to benefit. Yeah, so if you can keep finding what can I do that gives quite a lot of benefit for a low amount of effort, those will be the most study smart things to do. Yeah, so I always pride myself on studying smart when I was a student because I wasn't that uh, studious of a student or that diligent, especially in secondary school, I wasn't. So I always found those things where it's like, okay, I can study as little as possible, get a lot of benefit. This makes sense to do, so I study smart. Yeah. Then um, the last thing is, what's the last thing I was going to say? Yeah? Study smart. Oh, yes, okay. The last thing is that this period may be hard, right? Uh, and you might find yourself mugging most of the day, <laughs> which is what I experienced also um, when I was near A-levels. It was like for a month plus or maybe even two months, that was just my life. Wake up, just study, eat, study. And it feels, um, it definitely is difficult, right? But after that period was over, I look back on that and I'm like, wow, this is proof of my character. This is proof of what I can do. I can accomplish. Like I have so much focus. I have so much concentration. So it really does build your confidence in your own character. So I think you'll like it. Hmm. Oh, okay. I had a extra question that I thought of. Okay, so a lot of things that we discussed, right? Um, uh, how to study of like, you know, compiling the three C's into notebook of hunting exercise in prelim papers for exposure questions. Then some students might, and, and then the speed training also. So some students, I think, okay, I, I'm putting myself <coughs> back in when I was in secondary school, right? If I hear all this, I'll be like, ah, there's too much to do. I, I don't think I would do it. So, is this only, you know, for a certain kind of student that they are willing to do all these things? Or is it like, uh, for, for those who are, who was like me, is there a way to, like, compromise that and, I guess, not do so, so many different things? What, what do you say to those students who, who give this objection? I think it depends on what goals you have for yourself. Mm. If you just say, you know, Dylan, I just want to pass, then you can... You know, just delete everything that we've mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just doing the exam. Uh, but I mean, if you come in from a point of view that you really want to score the A1, then uh, having this structure, having these strategies in place can help you to, uh, you know, get your grades, or, you know, have a higher chance of getting the, the score that you want, you know, with all the things that we have fine-tuned and refined over, over the past decade. Yeah. So whatever you know, goals that you want to achieve, then there's a price to pay. Mm. Yeah, that's something that I truly believe in. Mm. Yeah, so, yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing, mm. that there's a price to pay mm. for the success that you want. Okay, so lastly, where can mm. students find your math tuition? So I know you're not accepting sec force mm. anymore, right? Because yeah. it's too late in the year. Um, but for perhaps the other levels, where can they find your math tuition? And where they can they find your resources or so? Mm, okay, so uh, we have classes, both physical classes and online classes. Uh, our physical class is at Novena. And then uh, you can find us on our social media accounts, uh, Paradigm underscore SG. And then uh, at the same time, we have a Telegram channel where we upload lots and lots of resources, right? And sometimes we conduct uh, crash courses and, you know, to offer some guidance to students free of charge, uh, especially when exams are around the corner. So 
Telegram channel, right? You can just search Paradigm and you should see us. Currently, we have around more than 10,000 students and parents that are already in the channel. So we believe that these things that we do can really help, you know, all of, all of you who are listening to this podcast. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll put all those links in the description mm. of this YouTube video. Okay, thank you so much, Dylan. Welcome. Hey guys, so if that was helpful for you, then subscribe to our channel. If you'd like to join our O-Level Pure Bio Tuition classes, then click the link below or go to thatbiotutor.com.